balsam fir. You can tell balsam fir because the needles lay flat. These flowers are bunch berries. Hey YouTubers, Muskrat Jim here. Let's find a place to sit down and have a little chat. Well, this looks like as good a place as any. What a beautiful day today. The sun is shining. Birds are singing. It's great. Just like any other day, you got to remember to stay hydrated. Well, a friend of mine tagged me. He wanted to know how I got into bushcraft and also how I got into YouTube. Well, it's kind of a long story. I hope it's not too boring of a story. My parents used to tell me that when I was really small, I used to curl up under the Christmas tree and fall asleep. I don't know if it was the Christmas lights or just being at the base of a tree that made me feel comfortable. Then as I grew older, my friends and I used to go into the woods and make tree forts. Not really on the ground, like a, a tarp shelter or anything. We would actually make um, like platforms up in the branches. And we used to spend hours and hours of the summers just uh, watching, you know, just sitting up there and just watching people go by or that sort of thing. As my son was growing up, the both of us joined the scouting movement. I put him in beavers and I became a beaver leader and then he went on to cubs and I became a cub leader and in that environment I was able to teach the young boys different things like plant identification um, that sort of thing. Parents don't like it when you tell their kids that they can eat bugs or eat weeds so we didn't really get into it too heavy. Since I was going to talk about cubs I brought my cub blanket with me just to show you. Well this is my Gilwell neckerchief. That Gilwell woggle. And these are the, the nuts. The Gilwell nuts, I guess. Okay, onto my blanket. My sister-in-law made my cub blanket into a poncho. The neck hole in the middle and a laced up front. She did a pretty good job. So this is the front of it. Got a bunch of badges there that I've collected over the years. There's a first aid badge in the middle of beaveries or cubberies that we went to. We planted some trees. Over here we took a, a trip to Maine. Had a good time there. And there's some search and rescue badges. And this is the back of it. Pretty plain except that I put my two scarves here, my two neckerchiefs from the two different groups that I belong to. The top one was the first Chatham, Beavers and Cubs. And then this one was the first Lancaster Baptist down in St. John, New Brunswick, where I was a beaver leader there for a little while. At about the same time, I was deeply involved with the local ground search and rescue. I progressed through the ranks from being a searcher up 
to be a trainer and into the executive. So while there, I had to learn and teach um, map and compass, search techniques, and radio operation. Well, no, I didn't teach radio operation, but I had to learn it. So I learned all the 10 codes, that sort of thing. The RCMP would often call us for help in searching for missing persons and also for evidence searching. And our searches took place at various times, in the summer, in the winter, in the daytime, at night. Anyway, I did get a chance to see a lot of New Brunswick's back country that I normally wouldn't have otherwise. After a number of years, I left the search and rescue as well. We seem to be spending less time in the woods doing training than we did fundraising. And that's not what I got into it for. So now, quite a few years later, my son's all grown up and uh, I've got some time on my own to spend. So I decided that I would spend more time in the bush. You know, honing my uh, survival skills, that sort of thing. And uh, I started, in 2011, I started a blog. Basically, I wanted to tell people to carry a personal survival kit with them at all times. Because of all the things that were happening, like the, the earthquake in Haiti, and Hurricane Katrina, and the ice storms in Maine and Quebec, and the blackouts in Ontario and New York, just a simple survival kit would help you make it through the night and that sort of thing if you uh, if you were up against it. At about the same time, I ran across Dave Pearson's YouTube channel, Really Big Monkey One. And I don't know how I came across his channel. Maybe I was looking for tarp shelters or something. But anyway, after watching a few of his videos, I commented on them and we emailed back and forth a fair amount and he talked me into starting to produce YouTube videos. So I was kind of hesitant because you know I was camera shy and everything. So uh, so my first few videos my face isn't in the video and then in some of them that some of the earlier ones I don't even look at the camera, you know, I just camera shy. <laughs> but anyway, I think I'm over that now, after two years. And But I still think that it's important that everybody carries a personal survival kit with a couple of items in it. A whistle for communication. Like those people that were trapped under the rubble in Haiti, if they had had a whistle, the searchers would be able to find them so much quicker. An emergency blanket. Sometimes at night it gets rather cold. And here in Canada, for example, you can die of hypothermia in the summer. So a small thin miler sheet, definitely worth its bulk. A small cutting tool, like a knife or something that you can help fashion other tools. Fire. At least one sure way of making fire. In the personal survival kit that I put on my blog, I actually put two ways of making fire in there. One was stormproof matches, and the other one was a Bic lighter. Not complicated, like fer uh, ferro rods or flint and steel or anything like that, you know. I mean, those methods are fine if you want to. Uh, you know, practice making fires that way. But in a real life situation, a life and death situation, you need a sure way of making fire. And then of course water is always important. So a metal container that you can boil water in to purify it, uh, or just a, you know, a Ziploc bag that you can transport water and water purification tablets. They don't take up any room at all and they're easy to use. So I hope that answers your question as to how I got into bushcraft, 
how I got into YouTube. But anyway, I'm not going to sit here and just talk, talk, talk. I'm going to make a cup of coffee and have a bit of a lunch. As you can see by the lengthening shadows, it's half past six. This is my new stove. I just got it from from China. I ordered the stove. It probably cost me six bucks or something like that. I don't have a lid for my cup, so we'll just have to let it boil. Now for coffee, I've got this little pouch. It's like a tea bag, but it's got coffee grounds in it. Last time I stayed at a hotel, they had these in my room, so I packed them with me. So it's just a matter of putting the bag right in there and waiting until the water is the color of coffee. Well, there, the water's boiling now. It's only been about two minutes or so. It's a heck of a lot faster than my alcohol stove, I can tell you. Well, I think that looks dark enough. Now, I'll let that stove cool while I eat. Now, I don't like to burn my lips. So I'm pouring this into another cup. Some coffee mate, also from the hotel. Pack it in, pack it out. Like I said, I don't like to burn my lips, so I'll put a little bit of water in there. Just to take it off the boil. Now, the rest of my lunch is as follows. One can of Brunswick sardines. Now there's a story behind that. I was born in the village that cans these. So I've been eating Brunswick sardines my whole life. And I really do like them. Cheese and crackers. Go with the sardines. Now I probably won't eat all three of these. I'll probably just eat one. And then for dessert, a chocolate cliff bar. Now these are the mustard variety. I like all of them. Mm -mm -mm. Good stuff. So to everyone in Black's Harbor, where they can these little fish, my best to you. This is Muskrat Jim on the shores of the Miramichi, signing out.